Hello. Hi. Good evening. Good evening, uh, Ted. Hello. <laughs> hello. Uh, wonderful to be here in your presence, so to speak. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> Across the miles. Uh -huh. <laughs> We're all good crazy, evening. but it's good crazy. Yeah. It's a great pleasure to talk to you, Ted. It's, um, yes. Thank remar you. Remarkable. This is, this is so a very much. special moment for us because uh, we always see what you are doing. Every time we see a new art from you, uh, we send to each other and we say, hey, did you see this? Look this! this. Is from Ted. All righty. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. The token calendar. Yes. Very good. So wow. you are always on our conversations, and it's now an honor to finally talk to you uh, in person, or at least through the video. Thank you. And, Thank and, you. It's good to be and here. Sergio, uh, Ted was the first artist and the first big name on Tolkien's work to let us to use his works. Yes. Do you remember? I, I, I got in touch through the inbox at Facebook and I said, oh, hello, I have a, a YouTube ten channel and we'd like to use your images here. And you promptly said, yes, can, you can use it, no problem. Yeah, and yeah. it was very nice. Yeah. Very, very kind. Yes. You're welcome. I've been to your country twice, um, but not for a few years now. I think 20, 2007 was maybe the last time, but um, uh, it was it, uh, always get an overwhelmingly wonderful experience there. Thanks. What, what yeah. we have an art workshop, right? What's that? Uh, and art workshop. You teach some techniques in some. Um, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not really, no. I, I've been asked to do this, but I don't. Maybe I may you have, can. I, I may have given a few tips, I guess. There is another member of our group. Uh, he's called uh, Alexandre Machado. He's a uh, graphic designer, and he went to see you in this one of these occasions. Okay, uh, right. Yes, I think I remember him. Yes. And he, he enjoyed it a lot. Check with a beard, dark beard. Uh, yes. Ted, I, wa I, I was in your uh, country last year, just before the lockdown in February. I have Hi. a cousin who lives in Toronto, and I, I uh, was there for three days. Oh, wow. Toronto, and I also went to Niagara Falls. It was very, very beautiful. Good. And I, I love Toronto because I was very lucky because I went there in the family day, the holiday. Right, and the, right. the streets, the streets were empty. There was no one in the streets, so I have all Toronto for me to explore. <laughs> I really good, loved good. it. Fantastic! It's a bit cold this time of year, but uh, yeah, yeah. But you, it was good, snowing good. at the time. Oh yeah, to go to Niagara Falls um, anytime is wonderful, of course. And I'm glad mm. you were able to do that. And in the winter, of course, it's spectacular with the snow and the yeah. ice. Everything was was. Uh, Frozen, but my my mm. cousin said it was uh, uh, more beautiful in the the summer and the the there is a different experience because we can go uh, with the boats just yes. by uh, the foot of the the falls. Yeah, the falls. Yes. At the yes. bottom. Well, yeah. You see, you have to come back now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> summertime. Yes, and uh, I oh, hope so. Come to the studio. <laughs> Be very welcome to come. To. Yeah. Oh, yes. You're very welcome to come. Just north of Toronto. <laughs> I'm most yeah, it's also in Ontario. I'm very nervous. <laughs> well, I think we have to start because uh, Ted has something else to do and let's not take more time than we need, okay? Sure. So, uh, I would, I'd like to welcome Ted Naismith to our channel and it's an honor to have you here with us. Uh, you are a big name in the token community. Everybody knows you. Here in Brazil, you are very, very appreciated. Everyone loves your art. And so I hope uh, everyone who is watching this interview, we will learn something about your life, your work, and what you think about talking. And this, is, this interview uh, here, we are continuing a long series of Talking Talk international interviews. And as, as I said, today we are talking to 
Ted Naismith, it's an honor for us. And as usual, our followers in Brazil will be able to follow this complete interview through the subtitles embedded here in the video. And now, uh, Inês, Cesar, and Ronald will give our audience a brief background about Ted Naismith. Okay, so first of all, before I, I start, I want to thank you again, you all, for being here. It's such a pleasure to be here with my friends, uh, Sergio, Cesar, and Ronald, and I'm very uh, happy to meet you, uh, Ted. So let's let's start to talk about um, Ted's life. So Ted Naismith was born in Godrich, Ontario, Canada, in the mid 50s. Uh, growing, up, growing up as a child kid, the young Ted entered high school and trained his drawing skills in a commercial art program. Ted was always a, an avid designer, drawing things like spaceships, airplanes, cars, and war scenes. By that time, Kathy, Ted's sister introduced him to The Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien. Now, there was a new interest for young Ted besides drowning. Later on, he starts to work as an architectural renderer. Along with his job, Ted Naismith matured his ability to drown Tolkien's work until it becomes a vocation. Then Ted became a member of the Tolkien Society, and he got in touch with Ellen and Unwin publishers, who accepted to have some of his art pieces published in the 1987 J.R. Tolkien calendar. And that was the first of many calendars he participated in. The latest is the 2021 calendar. The calendars were followed by an illustrated edition of the Silmarillion, which put Ted Naismith into the pantheon of Tolkien artists. Last year, Ted joined forces with Alan Lee and John Howe to make an illustrated edition of Unfinished Tales. Nice. So let's begin. And the first question, question by me. Um, Ted, what are your influences when it comes to painting? Also, what do you think about the very early artists that were pioneers in token-related art? People like brothers Hildebrandt, Cor Block, Pauline Baines, and Ingahid Grathmer, Margaret Seconds of Denmark. Right, yes. Um, to answer the first part, uh, the influences I have in my um, artwork really range from some of the great illustrators of the 19th century, Arthur Rackham um, and Maxfield Parrish, uh, early 20th century American. There are various people that, um, you know, uh, Norman Rockwell um, and a lot of uh, fine art painters, landscape painters like Albert Bierstadt, um, Frederick Church, uh, Thomas Cole, uh, Achenbach in Germany, um, Iwasowski, uh, several Norwegian um, landscape painters and uh, so uh, quite a range and all of that to bring to Tolkien the sort of grand vision and epic look that I always thought it, you know, it, it ought to have. Um, and at the time when I started in the 70s, yes, Pauline Baines had done a number of illustrations. I love her work. I love her color work and her line work. Um, uh, you know, that sort of lovely medieval feel to it. And uh, also Joan Wyatt, who uh, published a book in the 70s, a Middle Earth portfolio, I believe it was called, or album, full of uh, illustrations of the Lord of the Rings. So at that time, when I was just getting started on my stuff, I thought her artwork captured a beautiful feel for Tolkien, even though it was fairly amateurish. She was an English amateur artist. but uh, And in the, uh, the back of that book, there was a little advertisement for the, the Tolkien Society. So as a Canadian, I hadn't realized that there was a literary society at all. Um, so I quickly got in touch with them and, you know, arranged to uh, subscribe to their newsletter and join the society. And by 1985, um, I was attending my first meeting in Oxford, England. Um, and from that began um, contacts that would get my work to Alan and Unwin um, a few years later. And well, the Tolkien calendar came together fairly quickly, as we know. Um, the 87. So that's a, that's a bit of a, an idea of where I got from 
you know, the, in, in the seventies period and the artists that were available at that time. So I, I, I the Hildebrandt's of course came out with their calendars in the seventies, uh, three in a row. And they were very, you know, they, they sold very well apparently. Um, and I didn't agree with a lot of their ideas, but it got me going on my own artwork thinking that, well, I could do better than that or at least keep closer to Tolkien's vision. Um, so in a way, they did me a favor, even though I kind of objected to the style, which for me was a bit too Disney-ish, um, yes. especially yes. things like Riv Rivendell, the cottage, the, you know, <laughs> gingerbread cottage for Rivendell, a bit <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> And uh, the Balrog, which we all know wasn't even following Tolkien's description <laughs> at all, even ex even though it gave it the wings that now have stuck with it ever since. Thank you very much. Uh, but yeah, these uh, Hildebrand. That, that's that's a funny thing because every time someone asks us if Balrogs have wings, we say no, according to Ted Naismith's painting. <laughs> yeah. So just go see that. Yes, just go <laughs> by my words. Definitely. Yes. And we show that picture uh, from Balrog and Gandalf. And a lot just, of Pindleton also. Just the flames, not the wings. And, and right. also the size of, of the Balrog. Yeah. It's double the elf. So yes. it's perfect. Yes, yes, okay, yes. Perfect. yes. Well, so you yes, saw you saw their paintings and you thought, okay, I need to do better. I can do better. Than that. Pretty much, yes, that's it. You know, and I definitely, you know, as an architectural renderer, you see, you take a, se a set of sketches and plans and ideas, and you turn them into an, a painting of a building that doesn't exist yet. Um, and in many ways, I really like kind of taking something else and improving on it with my own work, um, taking it somewhat further or to a more refined level. And the same goes for music with me as well. That, that's a whole other topic. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I, I didn't know you, you, you are a musician too. Yes. Yes. We'll talk about that later, okay? Did yes, you? later. Nice. Questions me about too. it. Yes, so. it's very good singer and guitar player. Nice. <laughs> Okay, so let's go to the next question. Uh, Ted, how was the feeling you got when you came to read Tolkien's book? Did you think that you had a whole new world uh, to discover through painting? Right. Um, the impact on me was as strong as it could be for anybody. And partly because I had no idea what Lord of the Rings was about. I had no idea what kind of a story it was, and I had never read anything like it, um, except as a boy with fairy tales and things. So my impression from the cover art, which, as we know, was Barbara Remington's wonderful, quirky, <laughs> abstract painting. With uh, the lion. You know, with the lion. With the, exactly, with the lion and the emus or something like that, the pink flamingos or some other thing. But uh, And you put the three pictures of the three different covers of the book together and it, it makes one picture, you know, and I had a big poster of that for a long time. But um, there was a waterfall on the cover of the fellowship and it looked to me like a rocket taking off. I mean, it just <laughs> completely gave me the idea. And I'm looking at it in the store when I'm going for, you know, to the variety store every so often. And I see this book there and uh, I think oh, it must be science fiction. So I open it up and it starts in this story that's set in this past, this mythical past. And there are these hobbits and there's this wizard um, and, and this terrible danger about this ring. And the whole thing hooked me very, very quickly. And I was just like, oh, my gosh, I love this. This is absolutely <laughs> wonderful. And pictures soon followed, of course. Excellent. And uh, I had no idea or no plans to draw fairy tales or anything else at that point in time. I was into cars. I thought I would be a car illustrator. And as you've seen some of my artwork, uh, that was another whole area for me. Yeah, yeah it was something natural that began to, to yeah. grow inside you. Absolutely, yes. The seed was there and I thought I must paint these um, scenes from this book. We're glad, we are very glad that the waterfall in the cover, so. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. goodness for that. Well, um, my turn. Uh, which real world locations inspire you to detail of your Middle Earth paintings? Well, um, 
in the earliest days, um, I would use picture reference from National Ge Geographic magazines um, and other sources from the libraries, but also take my own photographs in um, northern Ontario in the uh, forests and lakes and, and all of that. Um, and when I was going to England and visiting people there, of course, I would take a number of photos from the uh, for the Shire kind of landscapes. Um, but uh, if, in the end, the more I look into Tolkien and the more I understand about his own life in, in the last few years, um, I realized that he got a lot of his own ideas from travels in Switzerland in about 1911. He was 19 years old. Um, so this uh, became um, a focus for me in the last number of years with um, scenes from the Alps that I know that influenced Tolkien. And uh, one painting that came out just at the end of the summer this year for a client, it was a commission, uh, shows the, the entrance to Moria. It's the fellowship approaching Moria. And it's just at the end of the day, there's a little bit of sun left and they have about an hour's drive an hour's journey to go to get to the other side of the, the flooded valley. And I happen to really know that, uh, visit the spot that inspired Tolkien's idea of the Moria entrance, which is a wall of rock coming straight out of water. Um, and that happens to be near Kandersteg, Switzerland. And there is, a, there is exactly what, you, you know, what he describes there in reality. So I decided to incorporate the real wall that I saw is, and, and shape it a little bit toward the picture. But, you know, you can recognize it for this uh, particular lo uh, location, this <laughs> landmark. And uh, so that's the kind of thing I've been doing more and more to be just as authentic as possible and to reflect what I thought Tolkien had, what had inspired Tolkien as well. We do know that the Lauterbrunnen Valley near um, Interlaken, was a primary inspiration for for Rivendell too, um, and um, yeah. So these are the kinds of, that's that's kind of getting me excited these days. Perfect. Uh, Ted, painting is drama. Do you feel entitled being one of the other hands Tolkien spoke about? Tolkien mentioned. Do you feel entitled to draw the most dramatic scenes, and what would those scenes be? Yes, and I guess I've covered most of those already, um, and I'm not terribly fond of doing bat battle scenes, but I have taken on a few of the key ones um, with um, Eowyn and the, the uh, Nazgul. Nazgul, you know, the Witch King, that one a couple times now, um, also Fall of Sauron. Battle at, <clears throat> the Battle of the Black Gate, yes, the Shadow yes. of Sauron, uh -huh. um, but I haven't done the Helm's Deep scene or, or anything, uh, but other epic scenes like um, I took on the uh, confrontation between Gandalf and the Witch King at the Shattered Doors of Minas Tirith and that was about this time last year I was finishing up that one and posting it. Uh, that was a private commission and it was a very difficult piece to kind of work out how we could make Gandalf who's fairly static as it's described to stand out and seem dominant considering the description of the Witch King as being terrifying and um, incredibly evil and um, all sort of, you know, ran for cover and cowered and, and, and you know, wailed in his presence. And behind him, you see Grand, the great Warhammer, um, poised after it smashed the doors. So that was an epic scene that I was very proud of having pulled off as well as I did and including the architectural considerations that um, Minas Tirith, I think we've settled on the idea that it's a combination of white and black stone or gray and black stone. The outer wall is black but most people don't really sort of depict it that way because it's called the White City. <laughs> but uh, but it, to, be, to be fair to Tolkien that is what is required and so I, I, I you know I took time to do as accurate and, you know, effective and dynamic a scene as I could. And it, it turned out to be pretty, pretty effective, I thought. Uh, so this is how I do it. You you even remembered to to draw the, the rooster on yes. the corner of the... Well, it's very that nice. Was, 
Cool. That was requested of me, even though he's really off stage. He's kind of somewhere behind us, up up in the city. But uh, yeah, the cock crowing. Yes. So and and he's black and white too. You notice. <laughs> <laughs> And the outside wall of Minas Tirith being black is the same material of Orfang, the Isengard. Yeah, we're not. I wonder. He doesn't say particularly, but it would seem like it might be. No, maybe. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Uh, can you tell us something about the techniques you use to create your scenes, and do you prefer any one of them? No, oh, right. Um, <clears throat> there are just far too many now for me to really choose favorites. It will be a passing favorite and then another favorite after that one when, when I get tired of the other favorites. <laughs> um, uh, <clears throat> sorry, what did you ask before that? Oh, well, techniques. Yes, techniques. Right. So, well, let's let's assume that I'm starting on the final painting itself on the board and I use illustration board. It's high quality stuff. It's wonderful. I paint in gouache, which is not that well known by most people. They understand acrylics and oils and that sort of thing, but and watercolor. But uh, gouache. gouache is a, is a opaque color uh, that's water soluble, and it is, it's, it's actually very very good for detail. So, and I've been using that since high school. Um, I will usually start by transferring a, a large size drawing, the same size as a full size original, onto the board itself using carbon paper. And so you just draw over what you've done in a hard pencil and that comes out as line work on the board. And now you have a basic drawing. I, I may start with the sky or the furthest out areas um, to, to paint them. And that sometimes involves masking off areas with what's called frisket so that uh, I don't uh, paint into areas that I want to keep um, pure. Um, if you get a bit of transparency in the painting itself, um, that it, it's more luminous, you see. So if you have something that's bright and you have something that's darker next to it, you want to protect the bright area from the spillover. Mm -hmm. So there's things like that that you take into consideration. So it's a, it's a stage by stage process. And that um, usually starts with the roughest, um, very quick uh, wet painting technique, blending colors together, suggesting some of the texture and this sort of thing. Um, and once all that stage is kind of uh, finished with, um, I would begin to, to do more detailed work with smaller brushes. Um, and I would section off a certain area um, and do that part maybe and move to another part. Um, it's just like small little jobs that all kind of come together and it, Each stage, I may go back and change, make changes or, or improvements as well. So it just gradually builds up till I'm satisfied that I've got pretty close to what I need for the thing. Um, yeah. And um, any other <laughs> questions on? It's complicated. You know. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Hard to describe it without showing it. Nice. Uh, okay, so also related with the techniques or, or not, maybe. Uh, usually, how long does it take to finish a painting from the scratch until the final art? And which painting was the one that took you longer to finish? Two questions. <laughs> yes, uh, well, I'll answer the first, the second question first, which would be that um, the most recent piece that I just finished and just, just uh, shipped it down to the person who commissioned it. Um, was larger than usual, 30 by 22 inches, and um, it depicts the Balrog against Glorfindel. I'm about to post that on Facebook. Yes, and, we saw um, that one. You're right, it's been kind of getting around a little bit here and there. I may have put the sketch out, but um, it took about a month to do, a month and a half from early thumbnails and discussions with the client and Uh, and on to the final piece of art and I worked on it not every day necessarily um, but mm -hmm. I just a little bit at a time and um, yeah it, it took probably longer than most of them do um, the more figures the more anim like the more um, architectural elements and or figures and costume the slower it goes and I would say the average piece could be done in about the space of three weeks um, but it's hard to gauge because I'm kind of semi-retired these days or I'm 
kind of not looking at the clock all that much of the time and there's not a lot of pressure necessarily. <laughs> well, I so, think that's uh, very quick. I thought it took, took longer. <laughs> yeah, I'm impressed. Yeah. I'm impressed. Well, and the thing is, sometimes uh, the idea will be there. I'll have a little thumbnail drawing or a couple of various variations on that. And it sits around and it gels in my mind for literally years and years uh, before I get to paint the picture. So that's another aspect of it. That's that it's, it's good that it takes me time to get to them sometimes. Um, and I do think about it carefully along the way. I'm trying to be more conscientious and not be too uh, hasty at all, like Treebeard. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. Well, not, not cutting in, Cesar, but uh, for a long time I thought everything that Ted just said was a fake because actually he goes to Middle Earth, takes a photograph, <laughs> takes a and that's it. I just yes. want to know, Ted, what kind of camera do you use? <laughs> okay, it's a very Cesar. special camera. <laughs> this yes, is an yes. internal joke of us. Uh, Ronald always said that Ted Naismith is the photograph of Middle Earth. <laughs> yes, well, yes, I know. I've always gotten that comment on anything I've done that it's quite photographic, and I, I, I literally work against that nowadays and try to <clears throat> be a bit more painterly, as they would say, um, and, and leave areas a little less finished. I mean, I do do that sometimes in the past as well, but, but um, it is difficult to know when to stop to when when <laughs> something is enough um, and I will actually work backwards and de detail something sometimes uh -huh. that's gotten too um, precision and it's too cold or something too stiff and loosen it up so um, I'm, I'm, I'm at least I can take the trouble to you know take what do you call zoom out look at it carefully get a fresh impression the next day and and uh, work accordingly to perfect it and imperfection is the perfection of it this is a difficulty with every artist i think yeah definitely you're gonna love this this next question sometime some time ago you posted some remakes of previous works why these paintings did you have some token feeling of coming back and proving the same story? In this yeah, video? yes, it's, the, it's essentially that. It's me improving on myself, um, deciding that I have a new idea for how to interpret the scene, or maybe I've just been commissioned to do that same scene again, so I now decide, well, I'm going to make some changes or add something new to it. Um, sometimes it is because I decide I have something new to add to it, but uh, generally speaking, I feel like it's my life's work and I'm, imp I'm maturing as I go along and I, I just enjoy representing something. Um, and, and some of them, it's just, it, it's almost the natural uh, order of things that uh, Rivendell keeps coming up every few years and I do, do a new version, say, or a different uh, part of this that, that area of Middle Earth or something. Um, Argonoth, that's done four times now. I think Minas Tirith four or five times easily. And there are a couple of other subjects that um, I do seem to return to. But uh, it, it's, it's conscious. You, you know, I, I do love to do that. <clears throat> All right. Uh, well, everyone seems to have her or his favorite painting. I myself prefer Rivendell and the Blue Wizards, which is on the cover of, the, of this year's uh, Tolkien calendar. Do you have any yourself, any favorite paintings? Um, I do. I do have favorites. Um, one that comes to mind is the uh, Kin Slaying at El Colonde that came out in the mm. Silmarillion. And part of the reason is that uh, Christopher Tolkien quite liked the uh, color sketch that I had done. Uh, some years before, um, and he wanted that to be part of the illustrations in the book when we were uh, planning all those artworks. Um, and it, it was a difficult subject because it had um, architectural elements. The design of the ships had to be reasonably you know, accurate to what we would think it would be, and something like that. You really don't, your imagination is going to be better than what any artist can can, can show you. And then you have a battle scene, which, as I said, I, I don't really care to do uh, as a first choice, but uh, let's, you know, give it my best uh, shot. And then you've got very little light because it's all in starlight. So all those things with uh, lamp light and all of these other um, 
things contributing should have suggested it would be very difficult and probably fail as a piece of art. But I felt like it came off pretty well and very proud of it. Um, yes. and I even managed to inject a little bit of fairiness into it, I felt, with um, the water being a bit more aqua than would be real, probably. But I, I do take chances like that because I just follow my gut feeling about something, maybe. But that was one favorite. Um, the Fair Valley of Rivendell, I would call a favorite. Um, the Gandalf and the Witch King at the gate uh, scene, I forget the exact title. Um, this one that I've just done with Glorfindel, I felt was a, a real triumph because um, we went against Tolkien's description of the scene taking place at night. And I'm showing a Balrog that is not in flame, which is a bit different too. So we had some interesting ideas about that, but we felt like um, having been to the Swiss Alps, that the refugees coming out of Gondolin uh, after the sacking of the city would have taken most of the night just to get to the top of the pass, and it would have been dawn by that point. So we decided that logic would prevail in this case um, and realism, and it gave us a, a bit more of an interesting um, idea for the scene. Uh, and I wanted Glorfindel's golden armor to just be sparkling, so that was one of the reasons we did it that way. So that was a, that will probably be a bit of a favorite for a while for me, being the biggest one that I've done lately too. Um, but there are others, yeah. I could. <laughs> it's easy to start thinking back to them, and yeah, oh yeah, I'll get that one again too. Uh, the mirror mirror was another one I felt very very proud of yes. having achieved that. Yeah, yeah. Everything's reflected, and that was very technical. Yes. And the one the Talking Society uh, last year. Oh yes, uh, Taniquetel. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, Tanique yeah. That one, that was one of the ones that gelled for years and years. I had a full-size drawing up in my wall in my studio for about four years. Before that, color sketches, two different versions. So we, I had a lull. I would finally had a bit of a quiet time, and I thought I'm going to do this one finally. And it was well, it was well received, thankfully. What proportion of your total output, formerly and now, consists of talking-related pictures? Oh, of my all, all, all of my art, you mean? <clears throat> yes. Oh gosh, it must be two thirds of it at least. I would think, maybe more. That was that would be an interesting one to try and quantify. I have no system, <laughs> so it's, it's lately. All I, I, <clears throat> I lately I saw some Game of Thrones, uh, a Song of Ice and Fire, by you. Ah. Right, right. Yes, yes. That was another one that I was very proud of the work I did. It took three years to illustrate that book. And I, I just kept them waiting because I wasn't able to do that full time, but I certainly was committed to giving them the best I could. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So next next question. Uh, you uh, uh, talking about Game of Thrones? You were you have one of the the Red Keep, right, of the uh, King's Landing of uh, Game of Thrones? Yes. No, no, a Game of Thrones. Yeah, it's, I I really like that one. Thank you. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, um, some scenes are des described by Tolkien in such a visual way uh, that even we think I could paint that. Uh, which scenes inspire you to transfer the description to the picture? Um, so you're you're asking me um, which um, description in Tolkien I found most yeah. um, easy to translate? Say. Hmm. Yeah, it could be that. I th it's it's really I mean I, I can't think of one specific one offhand I mean uh, they all whenever I read this stuff it just you know it it, it, it excites me um, um, and I don't read it very often because I don't want to get too used to it and I find that it does um, come across as almost like the first time I've read it and I, there's parts of it that I completely forget sometimes, and that's one of the reasons I, I will go back and find new reasons to paint pictures or see, see scenes that I didn't see before necessarily. Um, there are very beautiful passages in, in so many places in the book. I love the scenes of the Shire, especially the early parts of the book, the descriptions of the three hobbits um, traveling towards uh, the ferry and being yeah. followed by the Black Rider, you know, that... Uh, 
at all of that. It's just absolutely and meeting the elves in the in the woody end. Yes, yes. Just poetry, yeah. absolutely, and the, the just the moment when they're leaving Bag End for the first time and heading out to uh, they know. Yeah, I can choose Something which of your picture is my favorite, but I love the Shire ones. I don't know, it's I, I'm a hobbit, so <laughs> I'm yeah. Shire, but uh, I don't know, it's it, I feel so peaceful and warm looking at those those pictures, the Shire ones, the landscape, the sun, very beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Very it's good, like a yeah. picture, it's like a photograph. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's me with my camera. <laughs> you you have been there. you were there. <laughs> Definitely. Well, how was the experience of working with both John Howey and Alan Lee for the anniversary edition of Unfinished Tales? Um, that was amazing, actually. Um, I, that was the last thing I expected to come together the way it did. And uh, I'll give you a brief description. If We'll see if it's brief. We'll see. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, how Take it started, time, no problem. Yeah, no, um, how that started was that there was a scheme to illustrate Unfinished Tales back in 2005, just after the Silmarillion uh, Illustrated was, was published a second time. And we talked about it, and I put together a whole scheme. There were all kinds of thumbnails for all through the chapters, and um, it was considered very carefully, but Christopher Tolkien decided not to go ahead with it. And I think the reason probably was to do with he came to regard Unfinished Tales as a bit of an orphan, published in 1980, before any of the History of Middle-earth books were being considered, or that he would take that on as a project, which part of what Unfinished Tales was, was what be, what, the, un, what, what the home books became, the History of Middle-earth books became, a far, a far more detailed and chronological study of all the writings. Um, but readers love Unfinished Tales. It sold very, very well in the first years. So it was coming up to the 40th anniversary this year. And uh, Harper Collins uh, contacted me back in last spring. And, and no, wait a minute. It was me contacting them. And I saw how Amazon Prime was bringing out this new Lord of the Rings set in the Second Age and that would involve Numenorean stories. Um, mm -hmm. And I contacted Chris Smith at HarperCollins, my longtime editor, and I suggested to him that uh, it would be a good time to uh, reconsider uh, Unfinished Tales because, um, you know, the interest in the Second Age is going to be considerable now with uh -huh. this video series. Well, he said, well, it just so happens that we are thinking about doing an illustrated edition And he said, could you just send me that same set of thumbnails that you did back in 2005? Uh, and so I took a couple of weeks to update the whole thing and put it on a PowerPoint presentation and added new pieces and fixed some of the other ones that were there, and improved them as well, and sent that off to him. And he said, this is going to be very, very useful. Thank you so much. He said, we're considering a multi-artist illustrated edition or maybe a single. We're not sure quite yet. We haven't decided. So that would have been back in April, May of 2019. 2020, 2020, yeah. So, uh, sorry, that, that's right, 2019. I'm getting ahead of myself. And so I went off to Birmingham to Tolkien 2019 a few weeks later. I met up with Alan Lee there. We were both there as presenters, and he said, I think we may be working together soon. <laughs> and that's all he said about that, and I didn't ask any more questions. Um, I did hear from Chris a few weeks later in August that, uh, yes, they were going to go ahead with this illustrated edition, which would have Alan, John, and myself. And he said, we'd never done this before, so it would need to be um, decided who was going to do what scenes. And uh, from that, he asked me to just give him a list of my favorite ones, my short list of my favorites, and then second choices, which I did. And, uh, and he would do the same with Alan and would do the same with John. Now, we couldn't all get all the ones we wanted. There was going to be overlap to some extent, but uh, Chris managed to uh, work it out pretty, pretty well, and everyone seemed 
fairly happy with the the outcome. I, I asked him to give me the one of Gondolin in the snow. That was the only one I really requested. I really wanted to do that one, you know. <laughs> and I kind of discovered it by rereading the book, which I hadn't read in some time, and realizing that that one word snow was in the account in Unfinished Tales. It is not in the account in the Silmarillion, which is why the one that I did back years ago of Gondolin, uh, the hidden city, is with the green, uh, you know, the green uh, fields. The problem is, it's the middle of winter, and uh, when uh, Veronway and Tour travel there, it's through a winter scene, a winter season. Um, so the Silmarillion account isn't actually quite accurate, <laughs> but the Unfinished Tales is, and I thought this will be an amazing scene to show the whole thing is white on white, and we'll have it at dawn so that there's a lovely sort of light um, glow on the whole thing, and, and that's how that came together. But um, I was really happy with the choices I had to do a new Amon Ruth uh, scene and uh, the oath taking of Sirion and Eero, uh, which I had not successfully painted, I felt, back in 1990 or 1991, 1992 or so, thereabouts. So that was uh, how that worked out. Um, it was it was great. We, I, we none of us had any contact with each other during the production of it, but afterwards we had, of course, a lovely meeting with uh, uh, Brian Sibley back in September here. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Brian. But, uh, but it, yeah, it, it was a remarkable experience, and I was so glad for John to be part of that, uh, uh, and Alan with me. Uh, uh, Ted, um, among contemporary artists, is there anyone you think can "Quote unquote," photograph Middle Earth the way you do. Uh, yeah, Donato's pretty amazing, um, and he and I are friends. I, you know, oh, actually wow. spent time with him in a museum in Philadelphia one time, which is great. You know, we really uh, believe in the same artists and, and are influenced by the same artists in many ways. But uh, he goes for the more oil painting look, a more classical look, um, and old masters, you know, sort of thing. And he brings that sort of look to it. And, he does some Middle Earth, but not exclusively, of course. He's, he's usually doing many different kinds of genres and, and, and uh, projects. Let's see, who else? Um, uh, there, Yeah, there are some really amazing people out there. Um, also, some of the, some... Calvini, the Italian guy. Um, yeah, uh, I know some of the names. It's hard to remember all at, at once, but um, hmm. Yeah, I, I respect everybody, and I'm, I really, really <laughs> love seeing many of these different people and their different look to what they do. There, there is one that is also a photographer of Middle Earth, but he doesn't go into uh, uh, so he isn't so realistic. It's Matej Kadil. He's from Eastern Europe, I guess. Oh, okay. But yeah. it seems like he does with um, colored pencil, I guess. Yeah, yeah, but it seems like yeah. he makes a lot of scenes that uh, is not common to see the artists draw. I uh, think yeah. he's Czech or Slovakian. I think mm -hmm. Matej Chardil. Yes. Yeah, he's a young There's, guy and okay, yes. Yeah. So some, some lovely younger fellows coming up nowadays and, and girls and um, he's Danny from Dolphin. Czech Republic. I'm checking it. Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. Czech. Okay. Czech. Ah, Czech. 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 <laughs> and uh, it's an old joke. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. And uh, Denis, Denis uh, Gordiev from Russia. Yeah. Um, I've seen yeah. some well, of his color work recently. Interesting yes. fellow. And I met him in '92 um, oh, really? with Christopher Tolkien there. At the time, that was awesome. Yeah, I have uh, I have his um, Lord of the Rings paperback edition. Ah. Bit of a collectible that one, which uh, he gave to me thankfully. Yeah. yeah. There are so many people out there these days. The, the work of um, uh, Jenny Dolphin. Yes, Jenny. Yeah. And oh, Elena Kukanova, I think she's Russian, right? Yeah, yeah, she's yeah. good, yeah. I love them. And yeah. Anke Eisman. Um, Anke, yeah. Anke and I are friends too. And I love her. She's very devoted. Yeah. Her, her thing is Faramir. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Ted, please uh, tell us about the time you sent a letter to Tolkien and he answered you. Oh, yes, yes. Um, uh, one of my 
great regrets is having managed to lose that whole that letter altogether oh, years no. and years ago oh yeah it's gone long gone <laughs> but you know when you're a teenager you don't take care of things too well um and you don't think about the future so much <laughs> <laughs> but it would, that would have been 1972, so the year before Tolkien died, and I had just started a year before doing some pictures. Um, so I sent a series of photos of the unexpected party that was the first uh, painting um, done in high school in, in grade 12 at the time, but one of the first gouache ones too. Uh, so pictures of that. Uh, another one called Through the Forest, which was inspired by the Lord of the Rings, but wasn't actually something from it, it wasn't a scene from that. Uh, and then also um, various little studies and pencil drawings and things like that um, as well. So he commented on them very briefly. He said, my Bilbo looked a little too much like a child, um, which I took to heart <laughs> and revised my ideas naturally. Um, and uh, otherwise he praised the work, um, and which meant a lot to me as a 17-year-old at the time. Um, uh, and so, you know, it was just it was just nice to hear from the author himself and to for him to have taken the trouble. Now, it wasn't a handwritten letter. It would have been even more. I probably would have made sure I definitely saved it if it was uh, his handwriting. But uh, it was just his secretary, his correspondent secretary, writing his comments, copying them down and sending it back to me in an aerogram. Yeah. And how, how did you find his ad address? Did, who gave it to um, you? I sent it to the publisher. Yeah, that was it. Ah, okay. Sent to uh, Alan and Unwin. Yeah, and yeah, easy how it's done. Ronald, you also has a letter from them, right, Ronald? Uh, I have a letter from uh, from Mr. Unwin, who, when he was a child, wrote the review of yes, the famous the Hobbit. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but you didn't throw it away, right? Uh, I have it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere here. Yeah. Somewhere. I do. Somewhere. I, I don't, no, I still have it. I still have it. Okay. <laughs> good, good. If Ted uh, had some nightmares today, we are guilty. Oh, my letter in the middle of the night. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Waking up in a cold sweat. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure, sure if I go through those boxes one more time, I'll find it. I need to find it. Exactly. <laughs> Throwing it all over the place. <laughs> My precious. <laughs> yeah, the precious, absolutely, yes, yes. I mean, the, there, I, I've got so many pictures going now, so many sketches and drawings and all kinds of other stuff around the studio that it really is um, sometimes a needle in a haystack. I know I've got a drawing of that somewhere here, and I'm, gonna, I'm sure I can find it, or even entire files, which I'm not sure where, what drawer, or what stack, or what shelf it's on or anything. So, uh, yeah, it, it gets a bit crazy. Um, I'm not the best organizer, so, you know, <laughs> someone will take that role on one day, I hope. <laughs> Then again, Tolkien wasn't much of an organizer either, was he? And poor, yeah. his poor son, yeah. Christopher, had to wade through all of those boxes and <laughs> took him his entire life to figure it out what, what it is. And it's probably a, some left over still, who knows? <laughs> Yeah. I heard, Ted, that one of the uh, talking translators in Brazil is a very disorganized chap also. <laughs> I think it's the chap who translated The Lord of the Rings, not sure. <laughs> yes, who could, could it be? Who could it be? Well, we get there eventually. We muddle through it. Yep. <laughs> okay, since uh, talking about uh, Christopher, uh, how was your relation, uh, relation with him? And did you share some mail? Uh, and what did he say? What did he have to say about your art? Yes, he was very supportive of my art, uh, but he didn't trust me enough to not want to see what I was going to plan to do before he would say yes or no. But um, you see, the Silmarillion illustrations, uh, that came about because um, I decided in the 90s, the 1990s, that it would be interesting to go through and just decide which pictures came to mind most strongly and put a little mark at that point in the book. And after I had done all that, I started doing little pencil thumbnails. And from the thumbnails, I started to pick ones that I would do little color sketch drawings of. And once those were collected together into photocopies, I sent all that off to Harper Collins, And they uh, considered... And I was 
just suggesting we could do an art book of Silmarillion scenes, you know, had no idea of, about, you know, but putting them to forward as, as uh, illustrations or anything. But they did show them to Christopher at their next meeting. They used to have one every three months, I think. And he, for the first time, said that he would be willing to consider an illustrated edition of the Silmarillion based on that artwork. So that was a big plus, a big endorsement of my work. Um, and from there it progressed uh, steadily toward that very thing. But we only had about eight months once we had his approval on all the artwork and we had to decide that ahead of time. And that's, uh, it was quite grueling at times. Um, he wasn't getting on very well with the editors um, actually at HarperCollins, but he and I were getting on very well and he was very cordial with me. And so I had the suggestion at that time to let me and Christopher talk to each other directly, not through the editors, which would be the normal procedure. And they agreed to let us just, um, you know, work it out between us, which would be the illustrations. They just knew that whatever came down, it would be fine. Um, and that's, we continued that discussion until we had only eight months left and I had to 20, do 20 illustrations. So I uh, divided it into four groups of five, which I would do five every three months. And that was the pressure I put on myself. But in order to do this incredible work and to get this commission, which I had no, not expected to do at all. And ever since then, you know, Christopher had been very, very uh, protective of me in many ways. A few years later, in I guess 2002 or three, Harper Collins came up with the idea of putting out a, a, a newer edition with more illustrations. And they were just going to use the six extra illustrations that came out in the calendar in 2000, where I had done six different pieces that were in the book, as well as six that were in the book. Um, but, you know, Christopher didn't like this idea because he thought that we're going to, just going to put out a new edition with an extra few illustrations and people would you know, buy this book again in a larger format without mm -hmm. it being really justified. And he said, why don't you just give Ted an extra year and he could do, you know, another ser several pieces of art. So I added 25 illustrations over the next year which is why the 2004 edition has so many more pictures in it. And that was Christopher saying, what's the rush? Let's give him a bit more time and then, you know, and that's, a, I guess, a good example of what the relationship was like with him. Nice. This edition with extra pictures is this one with the Maglor floating off the Sumario in the sea. No, no, that's the first for 1998. That was the first one, yeah. The second one with the white ships from Valinor on the cover. Yeah. Perfect. Well, my favorite piece is the Niquetu. And uh, while ago, you posted some sketches of the Niquetu painting on your Facebook page. When we saw the final art, some changes could be noticed. Mm -hmm. Please tell, tell us about this process, the final and the sketch about the Niquetu. Right, it would be easier if I had exactly the sketches that I put up there, but I imagine those were color. Um, Maybe some trails of um, the top is some yeah. some um, composed of all. all oh of yes, I remember now that so that we were focusing mostly on the citadel at the top and got ideas for that and yeah that was freely drawn. I'm just getting kind of weird ideas and towers and arches and things of this kind and curving shapes and and so on that seemed very exotic and un, un otherworldly. And the lighting would be un, unusual. Um, it was, you know, and all, all, all the time I'm thinking about Tolkien's original painting and giving it a bit more of a realistic treatment. Yeah. And that was the that was the impetus. But um, it's it's I do revise ideas as I'm working sometimes, um, and I will wipe out something that I've already detailed and 
just do a whole new one over top of that. Um, and, you know, I'm the only one who may know about that. Or I may take photos of it at an earlier stage and then, you know, change things. And, and we will show it in stages, you know, if it was ever to review the whole thing, I would say, well, here's what it was at one point, And then we change this and, and put it in this instead and so on. Um, of course, with digital art, all of that can be done easily and you can just have various versions of the same piece oh. of art and people do that. That's too overwhelming for me. It's <laughs> once I'm done with it, I want it to be done and go away and not still look at me. <laughs> so that's, I don't know. This old school. This picture is my favorite. It's just mind blowing. The, the clown uh, uh, with the sun, above us and the, the top with the Varda and Manwe castle, castle, yes. I don't know, yes. with sparkles, it's just amazing. Thank you, thank you, lovely, thank you. Uh, Ted, besides plastic arts, you are also a talented musician. Uh, I have been told you have a beautiful voice and you play the guitar. How do you create music? And I mean, painting and music, are these in different compartments? Yes, there must be in slightly <laughs> different compartments. So you go down the hall and there's another door there and that says music on it. You go through there. <laughs> and uh, and I, I, I've always loved singing since I was a boy. Um, I have been in choirs and churches. I still part-time sing in a, in a church choir, except that that's all changed now with COVID. Uh, yeah. But my bro my brother Bruce is um, as talented in music as I am in my artwork, and uh, both of us, um, you know, love to work together. And so uh, it was inevitable that if I had any musical talent, it was going to be developed in our family. Uh, I have two musical brothers and a third brother who passed away, unfortunately, but she was, who was also a genius of music. So it, it's uh, very much part of the family heritage. And uh, as a teenager, just learned to play guitar kind of on my own, self-taught. And uh, I've had a, a facility for making up melodies. I, I always used to walk along and hum to myself and make up tunes and things. So all of that started to come together um, in my 20s, learning to play guitar properly, learning to learn the whole song all the way through, not in just a part of it or something like that. Um, and just And then getting into rock bands, playing bass, guitar, uh, singing in, into, into, you know, microphone, recording as well, and playing around with tape recorders, um, reel-to-reel -reel or cassette-based uh, systems and things of this kind. So self-recording became a bit of a hobby, and, a, and I always thought of the music as just personal, non-professional, Uh, just something to enjoy, and apparently it's not unusual. I mean, there are very, various visual artists who have a musical side and, and vice versa. Famous musicians who dabble in art like John Lennon or others or Joni Mitchell. Um, so it's, the two are paired, and sometimes writing and other kinds of artwork as well, you know, um, other, other types of art. So it's, it's lovely to have those choices of gift, but it's, There's, there's not enough hours in a day, that's the trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't done anything musical for quite a while now, but I have plans to do a new CD at some point. And there's Tolkien music and there's non-Tolkien music and there's other kinds of stuff that I've done. Um, you know, and, and in the two bands that I'm in, we just play rock and roll and country and R&B and, and cover songs and that sort of thing. Um, rather than the original songs too. So it's, it, I spread myself out, but there's no band gigs anymore either. That's all changed. With yes. So yeah, yeah. Just, I, should, I should have, by theory, a lot of time to do art and music um, at home. But uh, I still find that I'm pretty busy with the, with the regular work. Uh, it's taking up all my time. And Netflix. And Netflix. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, Ted, is there any Middle Earth scene, scene that you've always wanted to paint but still haven't tried? There's nothing that I have always wanted to do that I haven't tried yet, but uh, there are definitely lots of ones that I have thumbnails for, and I was just recently doing some new thumbnails for possibilities in case we have inquiries for commissions and they're looking for ideas. You know what I would like, like what I might like to do. You know, um, so 
Um, yeah, uh, it's more a case of thumbnails that I haven't followed up on yet, or color sketches that I haven't followed up on yet that are the, the germ of an idea, and then were I to take it to a full-size piece, it would be changed and developed and added to, um, you know, um, maybe completely changed and, and start over, uh, depending, but yeah, um, there is no one piece. <laughs> That's always a hard question. <laughs> okay. So, okay, uh, now uh, talking about Peter Jackson uh, movies, we all know that you were invited by Peter to work in, on the, produ the production sorry, of his uh, Lord of the Rings uh, trilogy. But unfortun unfortunately, you couldn't. Uh, regardless of this fact, there are some scenes in which we see your paintings coming to life on the big screen. How was the feeling of seeing your visual influence on the movies? Mixed feelings, <laughs> because I wasn't given any credit, um, and I know, ah. and I know, and I know that Mr. Jackson owns um, some originals of mine. We know that, um, but uh, it would have been helpful to at least have been acknowledged. And, and it wasn't just my art, but there were several artists who I know of. Yeah. You could sort of spot the scene, which was yeah. based on what they did. Uh, so those things should have been covered and acknowledged. I mean, I didn't expect to be paid or anything like that, but uh, it is unfortunate in that regard. But it was, a, of course, a compliment. And I know that the whole production team wanted continuity with what came before the movie, which was a lot of artwork and a lot of, um, you know, visual ideas that had established the look of Middle Earth, and I was part of that process. Mm -hmm. Also, Jeff Murray, uh, t tell, tell us about this. Uh, about oh, yes. Yeah, did, did you remember? He, he passed away in 2006. Yes, yes. Jeff, Jeff, I, Jeff, I used to write uh, emails with him and argue about politics a lot. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's so, so sweet and um, talk with his... Uh, Ronald, me ajuda. Ele era muito acessível. Ah, he was very accessible, very easy to talk to. Yes. yes. Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> Cesar. Cesar, you're on. Well, you are a hardcore Tolkien reader. You haven't, haven't, haven't been painting Tolkien less no works like Outro and Ultro. What's your favorite Tolkien book and why? <laughs> mm, what day of the week is it? Um, well, I, I thought I, keep, I, I think I you're going to say uh, letters from Father Christmas because all the <laughs> illustrations are there already. <laughs> that would have been a good answer, actually. Yes, yes. Um, I can't. It's, it's a toss-up, I suppose, between Unfinished Tales and um, the Silmarillion, and. It would be crazy not to say the Lord of the Rings is, you know, the all-time favorite. But uh, I do find the Silmarillion because I was able to illustrate it um, as as a real, you know, project for my legacy. That it must, uh, you know, and and there are many, many more possibilities. And because it's written in a style that doesn't give you a lot of detail, it leaves more room for the artist to make interpretations, um, even if you get a green field wrong. So, uh, you know, in, in, but, uh, right. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's... Oh, well, uh, finally, Ted, what are your current projects? What are your future projects? Very short question, probably very long answer. Mm. <laughs> current projects, one I mentioned, yep. Dwarfendel's Bane. Um, Someone before that. Uh, oh well, the new Silmarillion edition that is coming out oh, in March. Perfect. Yes, and I did um, a new <laughs> painting for that one uh, of Luthien, the Tol Galen. Uh, wonderful to be able to do that particular scene. Um, Luthien was kind of off limits uh, on portraiture in general and monsters. There were certain criteria that Christopher Tolkien imposed at the time the Silmarillion was illustrated, which made it easier for me because it was um, stuff, stuff that I didn't have to worry about. I would just focus on the ones that I could do. 
anyway, uh, but uh, also that f fellowship approaching Moria back in August. Um, a couple of others this year, the um, Ithilien painting, I've just uh, arranged to have a print sent to a, a, a person who's requested it. And then upcoming right now, I'm doing Moria, the, the west gate of Moria with Gandalf standing in front, puzzling over the password, and that's with the two holly trees. Um, and that is a fairly simple piece uh, for a collector in uh, the Middle East, actually. So those are the ones at the moment, and there's a couple of other small little pieces coming up, and the possibility of uh, something non-Tolkien, uh, um, a landscape in England, uh, an unusual one. So that's another one we're looking at too. So there's a few different things coming at the moment, and um, yeah, and very busy actually. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, unfortunately, this was the last question of our interview. We have to end it. Uh, you are a busy man, and we can't say thank you enough for taking our time and talking to us. Uh, it's a realization for us to talk to you. We always see your art. We admire your work, and we see it in calendars and books and Internet when you post them on Facebook, and we are always delighted for your oh, Cesar is showing the I also the add here figure. something. <laughs> it's the only thing I have with your art is this game. I don't know if you remember. Oh yes, I do. Yes, yes, lovely. Yes, the I, trivia I have. game. Since everybody's showing, <laughs> I usually have a free sample of that one or any games oh, I've done. Cesar is showing his background, so. Yes, yeah, I mean, that's all right. the background here. Right, that's nice. That's nice. We exactly. Yeah. Spend time. Yeah. You know, time. It's just for something. We, uh, so, we had a very nice chat here today. We are very pleased. It was a great evening. And we will leave your website here in the description of the video so anyone can see your art or talk to uh, talk to you about commissions and music. Uh, I think your music is for, for sale on your website. Yes. So, it will be here in the description. And I'll let everyone here say goodbye to you or see you next time perhaps, not goodbye, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. you can say something for our followers here in Brazil. Spoken talkers. Yeah, well, I'll start. Uh, Ted, it was a very, very great pleasure talking to you, having the opportunity to chat with you. I've, uh, as I said, I'm a Talking Society member since 1980 or maybe maybe before that, so there's more than 40 years now going on, and most of this time was looking at pictures that you made and it was mm, a kind of a dream for me to be able to talk to the great Ted Naismith one of these days. I did. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that. Checklist. Very welcome. Thank you. On my bucket list. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I was very nervous. Um, normally, I, I just speak with some big crowds and the, the words just put in from my mouth, but today I'm speechless. Just, <laughs> speechless. <laughs> many mistakes with pronunciation, with all, but is um, is just a sign that I was very happy. We started this this channel five years ago, and you you, you was the first uh, big name to all of us to use your work, we uh, start a, a, a new uh, a new appreciation of the token in Brazil with many fo followers, many studies, many um, many guests, many guests, and uh, talk with John Garf. Talk, talk with Tajnaif, I just, I just can <laughs> say Hantale and Namarie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Perfect. So now I'm, I'm the last one. It's my turn. So uh, thank you again, uh, Ted, for being here with us today. Uh, it's such a pleasure, uh, as fans uh, of your work. And I hope you all guys have enjoyed this, uh, our second nice. interview. So, yes. Let's say goodbye to our followers too. 
Oh, <laughs> <laughs> he said, thank you so much. And, and yes, it's been an absolute, absolute honor to be here among you today, uh, to Sergio and Ron and, and, and all, the, all of the whole group here. Um, and, you know, uh, I love you all in Brazil, you know, my fans there. Um, Greetings from Canada. Let's all get through this COVID thing um, as best we can. Amen. And um, I, I hope we'll all be able to, to meet each other again in person yes. um, someday. Yes. We hope so. Thank all you very best. much. Yeah. Cheers. Wonderful. So let's uh, now if we can end the interview. <laughs> so I hope you guys have enjoyed this evening with us. Uh, and you know. What to do now you can follow our social medias and you can uh, use the links down below to help us through this journey and to accomplish many many more things many interviews and <laughs> to continue to grow up in in this uh how do i say virtual world in the internet so thank you uh, once again for being here and as i as i always say in portuguese um grande beijing bye <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Okay. Thank you, Ted. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Yeah. It's Bye, an guys. honor. Bye-bye. Bye now. -bye.